uh, this is Lu Yao. Um, I have greetings from Shanghai. I, I really hope I could be in uh, Amsterdam again because it's the hometown of one of my favorite philosophies, Spinoza. Um, how, however, I guess I would just uh, have to wait for one or two months before I go to Europe for my summer conferences. Um, but hope, hope I could bring you the same energy and passion to share our work today. This is a very exciting work, uh, um, empirical analysis of EIP 1559, transaction phase, waiting time, and consensus security. Uh, so today we will present um, um, this talk uh, uh, in this content of table. First, uh, I will have some background introductions um, for the general uh, principles. Then we will break it down to present uh, three major results. And finally, it will be the takeaways. Uh, so I will be presenting the first half and then Fang will take over to present the next half. Uh, first, uh, you know, really thanks to Ethereum. Uh, so we have a, such a wonderful conversation um, that is super intellectual and interdisciplinary. Uh, so our team uh, it, it, like ranges from computer science, economics, and data science. Uh, our background ranges um, from academia, industry to MCO. Um, and very excitingly, we even have two undergraduate students on, on the list of their co-authors. So it's also about innovative education and cultivate undergraduate research. Uh, also, actually, we work on, uh, we, we started this work during COVID-19 and we work across three time zones. Uh, finally, this is really sounds like a cooperation in my metaverse. Uh, so many of our co-authors, including Fang and me, we have never met in person. So don't be misled by uh, our, that last name we share that like, like millions of Chinese also share. Like we really have never met in person at all. Um, and now we will show you some virtualization from our data. So to confirm uh, the theoretical talk by Professor Ralph Gadden. So first, this is um, the, the figures uh, that Ralph Gadden just uh, had explained to you. Uh, for EIP 1559, you can see um, the gas limit uh, increases from uh, 15 million gas to um, it doubles to 30 million gas. So that, that is a figure. The second figure is the distribution of the gas use during our data range. So you can see it's uh, quite a, a little bit uneven and, and have like the extreme um, spikes at the end. Another thing is, uh, given the base phase updating rule, you can see the recycling behavior uh, of the base phase after EIP 1559. Finally, it is the figures for the net supply. So uh, Professor Ralph Garden had mentioned because we burned the base phase, as otherwise it's not going to avoid collusion. Uh, so there will be some deflations on the ether supply. And here is our major result. So we, uh, we have data from blockchain, from mammal pool, and even uh, off-chain exchanges. We get three major results by comparing what happens uh, before and after the London fog. So to remind you again, before the London fog, August 5th, uh, 2021, uh, we, we, are on, we are only having this legacy for surprise transaction fee mechanism. But afterwards, we introduced the EIP 1559. And, and as a user, you can choose either to adopt the legacy first price or the EIP 1559. So the first major result is on transaction fee. So we find, OK, yes. Yeah, so uh, the EIP 559 London fog has small effect on the gas fee level. Uh, however, it mitigates intra-block differences of gas fee paid. The second result is on waiting time. We, we found that it really reduces uh, users' waiting time, which is opportunity cost to, to transact on Ethereum. And finally, for consensus uh, security, even though it increases the block size, we really don't see a um, like big effect that, that decreases the consensus security. Uh, and, yeah, you know, so some of the results are really inspired by uh, Professor Ralph Gadden's game theoretical analysis. So here is kind of like our detailed contribution map. So for the transaction fee part, uh, it, it's really uh, inspired by uh, Professor Ralph Gadden's work. So he, he showed that uh, the EIP 559 is not a solution for scalability. So in our data, we confirm that we find, yes, not much reduction on the gas fee level. Um, and for the waiting time, actually, we don't see very con uh, like, like systematic uh, theoretical analysis before that. That seems our new empirical findings for the first time. And then for the consensus security part, uh, actually, we, we, we focused on different dimensions um, than um, Ralph Gadden's work. 
So hey, focus on the incentive compatibilities of users, miners, uh, and user miner collusion interactions. In our data analysis, we actually did not analyze that part. We analyzed uh, the three different dimensions, which are for create network node and minor extracted values. And here is the scope of our research. Basically, we collected data that is 70,000 blocks before the London fog. And uh, then we kind of like um, cut the period right after the London fog because the, the, during then there might not be too uh, much adoption yet. So we take uh, the 70,000 blocks after the 70,000 blocks of, of London fog. So, so it kind of like we compare the evenly before and after when the adoption rate already reaches 20%. Uh, and worth mentioning, our data is very rich. Uh, we have data from uh, five different sources. Um, some of them are blockchain data, some of them are off-chain exchange data. Uh, and, and I have to mention this very uh, valuable data here that is in ephemeral, uh, which uh, were the memo pool data uh, that is collected um, like uh, by our computer scientists, uh, uh, like uh, uh, actually spent um, th their part uh, um, because they are running four Ethereum four nodes. So actually, uh, already two weeks before the London fog, I was very anxious because I, I I really don't know how to solve the mammal put data waiting time negative problem, and and it's just the such a magic like their team had already collected that uh, mesh uh, like valuable data. And here, I also want to uh, introduce to all of you um, the methodologies we, uh, from the economic side, like the economic um, uh, intellectual metrics, like how we can analyze causal inferences of an event such as EIP-1559 from those data. So historically, we started with the Nobel Prize in 2002 to psychologists that introduced the lab experiment, which is, okay, if you want to study what is the effect of COVID-19 vaccine, you will randomly assign um, people and attend our conference today, one, one to take the vaccine and one to drink the water, and you see uh, the, the infection rate or reduce is significantly or not. Um, however, that kind of like lab experiment has strong uh, internal validity because it's come in a controlling uh, environment. However, it would have less uh, external validity because it does not cover too many people. Then we go to the 2019 field experiment. So Nobel Prize again. So, so those people, they went to poor countries like India and try to try different um, policies for alleviating prime, uh, poverty. So they, they have the policy conducted in one town and not in another town and compare whether their life income gets uh, increases significantly. So this would increase its externality. However, it's, it's very costly. You need to apply for a big grant so you can travel to India and, and, and incentivize your experiment. And in 2021, last year, we have uh, the Nobel Prize winner uh, the only Nobel Prize for analyzed causal effects from natural experiment, which is something like EIP-1559. So Ethereum, like EIP-1559, um, many of the academias do not know yet, but I would really... Okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, so I just uh, talk to uh, 2021. So, so uh, actually EIP-1559 is a um, natural experiment. So this is really a, bl a blessing for academia because in the future we can analyze all the EIPs to find causal inferences. So why natural experiment is so good? Because you don't need to apply for fundings for subject the payments to analyze um, uh, an experiment just for research. It will happen in reality. It's already incentivized. And thanks to blockchain, so, so natural experiment uh, plus blockchain has three other blessings. One thing is, Blockchain is transparent. All the data is already recorded, so you don't need to worry about uh, data um, availability issue. The second is uh, thanks to the asymmetric cryptography, all the users' uh, privacy already gets protected, so you don't need to apply for IRB. Finally, because uh, on Ethereum, so uh, it's a smart contract, so the, the, when you collect the data, it's an automation process. All of those will make a natural experiment, something like EIP plus blockchain, 
uh, a big blessing for academia, and and I really wanna uh, encourage uh, more uh, researchers uh, in and um, like causal inferences and and empirical researches to to research uh, the data on Ethereum blockchain. And here is uh, the basic principle. So in in general, if you wanna study causal inferences, we have the assumption. Um, that we have controlled all the other factors that might uh, affect the thing we want to measure. We have three things, so for example, the waiting time uh, as a measure that is the y axis. Uh, and we have the controls, which are the block features and the exchange features. Because we do not want to see an effect from the graph, it's just because of an NFT drop, or it's just because of time trends. Uh, and once those get controlled, so our data analysis method would, would know that if yet it will not happen, uh, the, uh, the waiting time will just follow the trend as a dash blue line. However, when EIP 1559 happen, um, you, you will move up to the upper line. So, and the difference will be the average treatment effect. Uh, I, I really think it's worth mentioning. Uh, to do interdisciplinary research, it's very important uh, we have open source code for interdisciplinary research. So all those methods are not that you know, uh, difficult, but the, in, right now um, I taught in course still in closed uh, source software uh, that, that are not familiar, um, like, like sci computer scientists or data scientists are not familiar with, but it's actually very uh, easy to understand. So to, uh, for this endeavor, uh, I, I have developed all the open source uh, coding Python, uh, and, and we released it in our research for this one, but I'm also going to release more uh, as open education resource in my future courses. Uh, and our major result on transaction fee uh, is as follows. So as I said, we control the block feature, which is the block size and block height. And we also control the exchange feature, which are the uh, volatility and return of investment of, the ETH, uh, of Ether. Uh, and the feature we want to know is once the e adoption on EIP-1559 increases, how will it affect the two things? One is the median uh, gas fee, uh, and another is intra-block gas, uh, gas fee volatility. Uh, and the results show that the first one will not change much because uh, London Fork is not the solution for scalability, and the second one uh, decreases significantly. Um, so if you only see those figures without uh, the scientific method we mentioned, you are not going to see clear clue on what is the change of the directions as you can see on this figure. And even if you see a uh, uh, something, it might not be the correct di direction. It might be because of an NFT drop or uh, something else. Uh, so what is the implication of our results? The first implication is um, yeah, in the future, uh, uh, as also Professor, this is resounding with his uh, 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 Professor Ralph Gadden's theoretical result, we should further increase user experience by making fee estimation easier. So uh, from his work, he just uh, said, for the legacy auction um, it, uh, to be truthfully is a BSC Nash equilibrium, re which requires all of you to, to learn how to uh, do calculus and take expectations at least. Um, but, but then the IP1559 option is a symmetric ex post equilibrium. You don't need to take expectation, understand probability distribution, um, and you can figure it, uh, the optimal uh, strategy out very simply. Uh, in this case, for bounded rational player, they would avoid all the um, overbeating, underbeating, create beating. So then the volatility will be much smaller, like what is comforting our data. So we should further think about it because people are bound irrational. So how can we design an easier fee estimation mechanism? The second is, um, yeah, there is no clear impact on gas fee level. So EIP-1559 will not be a solution for reducing gas in fee. We need to think about something else. Uh, we also have some side results. We find actually when uh, the higher the e Ethereum price volatility, the higher the gas fee levels. So that we, we but we, for EIP 159, right now we did not take those into consideration. So, so maybe in the future we should design mechanisms to reduce gas fee level when detecting high Ethereum price volatility. So, worth mentioning, our research contributes uh, to uh, three major literatures, <laughs> and two are Nobel Prize, and one is the Turing Awards. 
So first we contribute to, for our transaction fee mechanism design blockchain. Uh, actually, it's not related to anything crypto or money or investment. It's, it dates back to the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2007 about mechanism design. Um, and we further link the two of them even more advanced literature on bounded rationality and mechanism design. Uh, so the second literature we contribute to because we find the results about waiting time that's that's about market congestion. So that dates back to Nobel Prize in economics 2012 uh, on market design. Uh, and very interestingly, um, Professor uh, Alvin Ross in his open questions in market design, he had invention that many of the market design problems uh, cannot be solved by economics alone because uh, the situation is more and more complex and we would need uh, the contribution from computer scientists uh, to, to help um, adding more computational power to, to solve for the market design issue. Uh, and finally, uh, for our con uh, consensus security part, uh, it dates back to the Turing Awards in 2008 and 2009. Uh, 30 for, for those fam familiar with by denting general problems. Um, and, uh, and I would say it, it's something like thanks to Ethereum, like computer, sci uh, computer science and economics meet again on, on Ethereum. This is not the first time. Uh, and back to Herbert A. Simon, uh, who, who is one of my idol. Uh, so he, he, oh, no, uh, he introduced the bounded rationality to computer science and become the father of AI and win Turing Awards in uh, 1975. And he introduced the same founded rationality to uh, uh, economics that, um, and he made contributions to cognitive psychology and management science. He won Nobel Prize in 1978. And we are very uh, excited to add on to his work by um, contributing, adding mechanism design and the blockchain to this space. And, and thanks Ethereum again for us to conduct this interdisciplinary research. Uh, so since I have been sharing the, uh, in, in the econ perspective, um, now uh, I'm very excited to work on fine to, to share the computer science perspective, which is indispensable for the success of our project. Thank you. Well, th thanks, Luyao. Uh, I will uh, take over from here. Uh, Sharon, can you see the uh, slides? Yes, we can see. Sorry, I have to make this switch um, where I am. Um, OK, so one of the key findings of our uh, study is that transaction fee mechanism like the EIP 1559 actually uh, can have a surprising impact on the waiting time of transactions. You know, waiting time um, is the time that a user needs to wait to commit a transaction. And this is typically thought as a scalability issue. But nevertheless, we show that with a well-designed transaction fee mechanism, waiting time can be reduced significantly. That's kind of an interesting uh, observation. So uh, waiting time, as I said, is how long a user needs to wait for the transaction to be included in some block. So here we're not talking about the you know, block confirmation. We're just talking about the time that between when a user first is, you know, sends the transaction and the, and the time uh, the transaction is included in some block. Right, so it's the difference between these two timestamps. Um, while this definition is pretty simple, measuring it accurately it turns out to be pretty tricky, right? The time of inclusion is recorded on the blockchain. But the time when a transaction enters the mempool uh, is something not readily available, right? As we all know, mempool data is ephemeral. If you don't collect it, it it's gone. And you, can re you cannot retrieve it uh, 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 later. So to carry out this study, what we did is we set up a system uh, to collect and uh, record the mempool data approximately one month before uh, the EIP is scheduled to happen. And our uh, mempool collection system currently uh, consists of four nodes geographically distributed across the globe. And we are working to add more nodes uh, to this uh, system and, and under the sponsorship of uh, Ethereum Foundation. Um, and these nodes run uh, modified guest clients 
and they they are modified to record transactions as they enter the mempool. They record the timestamps along with the transaction. So now you may think we have the blockchain timestamp and we also have the mempool timestamp. Now we can we can calculate the waiting times, but not so soon. There's a very subtle issue that tripped us and tripped some previous works, and that th it's really not uh, obvious. Um, let me illustrate this uh, subtle issue with an example. So here we have a timeline. Uh, suppose this red dot is the time when the transaction enters the mempool. And let's suppose the same transaction is later mined in block 1001, okay? So in the block header, there's a field um, called the timestamp that's part of the block header. It's recorded on, on the blockchain, so you can go to ether scan to, to get it. So it's very tempting to compute the waiting time as the difference between these two values, right? The time that transaction enters mempool and the timestamp in that block. But if you do so, you will see that nearly 50% of the transactions have negative waiting time, right? This really puzzled us. And uh, this also puzzled some previous works where they ran into the same issue, but they had to basically gave up and discard uh, these wait, negative waiting time as, as outliers. So we kind of um, dig deeper. Um, initially, we thought this is a network synchronization issue. So we debugged the network. We added more nodes. We um, did a bunch of uh, um, you know, trials and errors. But none of that really solved this issue. So the aha moment of this um, of the, this part of the project is really the realization that this timestamp is not the right timestamp to use. Uh, this is an artifact of blockchain mining. This timestamp is not is is when proof of work starts, not when it ends. Right in proof of work mining or in proof of stake as well. Before you start mining, the miner first need to uh, assemble the block. So when and when the block is assembled, this timestamp is fixed. So this timestamp really is the time that the block is assembled. That's what miners usually put in a block. But the mining process usually takes, you know, on average 13 seconds. The time that uh, the waiting time should really be computed as the difference between the finish of uh, proof of work mining and, and the time mempool timestamp, not the start of proof of work, uh, proof of work mining. So we can we can. Uh, plot the timeline differently to make this issue even more obvious. So here we have three uh, nodes on the timeline. We have our nodes and the user sending the transaction and we have uh, a miner. Um, so the fir first thing that happens is the user uh, will propagate the transactions through the peer-to-peer -peer network, which will likely make to our node and one of the miners approximately at the same time for a regular user. And that's the time when we record the timestamp uh, for the mempool, uh, from the mempool. And that's also approximately the time that uh, the miner will put in the block, okay? Because that's, um, that's the time when the miner assemble the block and, and start mining. And so miner will now go on mining for a while and come up with the block, including a transaction. And that block will be again propagated through the peer-to-peer -peer network and at some point to reach our uh, full node. So the so in if we plot the timeline in this way, it becomes really obvious that the difference between block timestamp and the mempool timestamp is not the correct way to um, to calculate the waiting time. Instead, it, we should calculate the waiting time as the difference between the time that our node receives the block um, and, and the time that it receives the transaction in the mempool. So now that we see uh, the issue, uh, it's actually not hard to, to work around the issue. There are kind of two solutions. You can, you can have a full node to record the block time as uh, the time that it receives the block from the peer-to-peer -peer network. But actually there's another observation. We can use the timestamp in the next block, namely block 1002, as an approximation to the time that block 1001 is received on our full node. Well, this is because 
um, miners are incentivized to, to start mining as soon as it receives the previous block. So the timestamp the miner will put in block 1002 is, should typically be very close to the timestamp that it receives block 1001. And again, for a regular miner and for a regular user, um, the time that miner receives the block should be close to the time that our full node receives the block. And we did both, and they are uh, always almost, uh, almost always the same. That further confirms this observation. So that's how we collected the data. Uh, from the mempool data and the block, date, block time uh, data, we can uh, now calculate the waiting time and see, um, it's, uh, see the effects of EIP on waiting time. So we find that the waiting time significantly reduces after the London fork, okay? From seven seconds, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's I think leave the mean of the waiting time to something like 10 seconds. Um, this is possibly a result of easier fee estimation. Um, for example, user may, um, there, there is prob probably less uh, underbidding and this is also this also might be a result of the variable size the blocks, um, as Tim put it. Maybe we are borrowing some capacity from near future to reduce the uh, time that the transaction has to wait in the mempool. But there's yet no uh, formal model that that can e explain this. Um, right. So uh, therefore, um, another point to make is uh, this reduction of waiting time actually benefits both. Uh, the transaction that adopts the new bidding style and the ones that 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 doesn't that, that don't so EIP 1559 actually improved the waiting time for all transactions even though it's not all users have adopted it at, at least by the time of our study um, another part of the result is we looked into the effect of uh, EIP 1559 on uh, consensus security because the EIP changes some important security um, or, uh, or consensus parameters such as block size and the incentives of miners and users. So the question is, does it affect uh, consensus security? And to understand the impact, we identified three possible avenues through which the EIP might affect consensus security. They are fork rates, uh, network load, and, uh, and the incentives, MEV in particular. So we'll now go through them uh, one by one. It's well known that larger blocks uh, could lead to more forks because larger, block, larger blocks may take more time to propagate through the network. So this may lead to more forks and a lower, a lower threshold against the adversary uh, parties. And so that's possibly a safety, uh, that, that's a possibly uh, a negative impact on the safety of a uh, consensus protocol. So our results, right, so an EIP indeed introduces variable block sizes. Previously, um, block is, size is kept over uh, at uh, um, 15 uh, million gas, but after EIP, there's occasionally 30 million gas blocks um, in the network. So the question is, does that, uh, uh, does that lead to more forks? Does that lead to a significant increase of the forks? Well, this is not hard to figure out. Um, uh, in our study, we looked at the uncle rate in the Ethereum uh, blockchain. And our conclusion, our, our result is that there's a slight risk in fork rates. It's about the 3% uh, risk in fork rates. Uh, so EIP does have a very mild uh, negative impact on fork rates and therefore on security. Um, but, but again, the extent of the impact is, is uh, very, moder very, very modest. Another natural question that's related is whether EIP um, will put the network uh, under a significantly higher load. Uh, what, what, what is the network load? Uh, because EIP uh, introduces variable block size. So at, some, at, at, at times there will be large blocks much larger, like two times larger blocks uh, than, than what we have previously. So during that period of time, um, the peer-to-peer -peer network need to, need to process more data and propagate more data, uh, basically need to consume more resources. 
So the question is, is that something uh, to, to worry about? And the community actually debated about this. Right? The Vitalik's argument actually, he, he argued that this is not something so new because um, the short-term spikes already happens before, even before in the introduction of variable block size, because, because of the stochastic nature of proof of work mining, just due to randomness, uh, it is possible that you get uh, many blocks in a short succession. Um, so that also leads to a, a higher network load. So higher network load or network load spikes is not a new phenomenon. That's Vitalik's argument. So this is like nothing to worry about. We want to uh, validate this argument uh, empirically. Um, so first we define a network load to something that can be measured. Uh, we define it as um, the average gas used over um, per time unit over some over different time intervals, for example, over um, 20 seconds uh, to, to uh, 112 seconds. We can compute uh, the expected average load, right? Because on average, the gas limit uh, of a block, the gas used to, uh, in a block is approxim approximately 15 million gas even after EIP. Um, and the average block time is 13 seconds. If you do the math, you, uh, the average gas consumption per second should be around 1.2 million uh, gas per second, something like that. And this, this graph uh, shows the result, the, the measurement of uh, network load uh, for T equals uh, 60 seconds. So to get this graph, uh, we divide time uh, into 60 second intervals. And for each interval, we calculate the average gas per second, average gas used per second. And this graph nicely summarizes the distribution of network load. So the y-axis is network load. And the width of the, of the shape um, is proportional to the um, density. The wider it is, the more, the more, um, the more concentration around that particular uh, network load. So as you can see, first of all, the distribution is indeed centered around the, the expected average, like right? something near uh, one uh, million gas per second. And second, we do observe spikes even before, before EIP and post EIP. And we do observe a little bit larger spike post EIP. But if you take the frequency of these events into consideration, our results uh, actually confirms Vitalik's uh, uh, argument that uh, this, um, EIP, uh, the new EIP doesn't put the block under a significantly higher load for an extended period of time. Uh, we do observe load spikes, but its frequency, the change in frequency is not significantly, uh, the, yeah, the frequency is not significantly different before or after the London fork. Right, so the takeaway, yeah, is that the difference really is not significant. Um, another um, aspect of consensus security that uh, we looked into is um, miners revenue and in particular uh, miners revenue from miner extractable value. The reason we are curious about how EIP might affect MEV is that um, uh, you know, some miners uh, resort to MEV extraction to, uh, as a way to help offset some of the potential revenue losses um, by EIP, or at least that's how, how they perceive uh, the EIP, uh, the, the effect of EIP on their revenue. So we are curious to, to see whether uh, indeed the MEV uh, extraction level uh, changes before or after EIP. And it, we, uh, it's hard to measure EIP in the entire Ethereum blockchain, so we use the um, Flashbots MEV as a, an approximation. Um, the reason is that Flashbots is by far one of the largest um, software that miners can use to extract yeah, uh, MEV. And also uh, just the fact that they have a very transparent uh, API that exposes such data for analysis. Um, so our um, observation is that the absolute value of EIP, uh, oh, sorry, the absolute value of MEV extracted through flashbots didn't change significantly before or after the EIP, but because the base fees are burnt, 
MEV becomes a larger share of uh, miners' revenue. And this graph plots the ratio between uh, MEV and the block gas uh, and, and the fees um, uh, from, uh, uh, yeah, uh, transaction fees um, from, from gas. Right, sorry, this is a typo. This is not the block gas used, but transaction fees uh, from, uh, from gas. So you can clearly see a, a upward trend. Uh, this is simply because um, I, I think that the fees are, base fees are burned. Therefore, miners revenue from gas uh, reduces in general, but their revenue from MEV roughly remains the same. So MEV becomes a larger share. So the impact of this, um, we can, this is, uh, we don't have formal explanation for the impact of this, but we conjecture that this might create an incentive for miners to invest more in, yet in MEV extraction, because indeed, as this news has reported, um, it's consistent with miners um, uh, perception that uh, um, the MEV extraction is kind of, um, um, the, the, the level of extraction actually is not impact by uh, the EIP. Okay, so, so far uh, the results uh, uh, we have presented is based on the data from uh, about uh, 10 days before the EIP and about three uh, weeks after it. Uh, or uh, 30 days up after it. Um, yeah. So to verify the robustness of our conclusion, we extended the period of time uh, by another two months. Um, so we recently um, extended the, the, the results uh, using data up until uh, November of uh, last year. You can actually see that um, on the, here, here's a, a the plot for the waiting time for these two uh, periods. Uh, this graph you have seen up until uh, three weeks after the EIP, um, the reduction of waiting time is about 49%. Um, up until November last year, the reduction of waiting time is still uh, very significant, about 41%. So this shows that the reduction of waiting time is not uh, actually a short um, term phenomenon. It's something that, that, is, um, that seems um, persistent. So to summarize, um, in this study, we use rich data from Ethereum blockchain, mempool and exchanges to study the impact of EIP 1559 empirically uh, to complement the theoretical analysis um, uh, out there, uh, for example, the paper from Professor Ross Garden. So we find that um, there are, at the high level, three major findings. Uh, we find that the EIP improve, improves uh, user, um, may, may have improved the user experiences by making uh, fee estimation easier. As, as Tim put it, this uh, can reduce the cognitive load because uh, users can stick to the obvious uh, optimal strategy. And indeed, we observe that bids are consistent with um, optimal, there are the optimal, uh, obvious uh, optimal strategy. And another finding is that we find that EIP reduces the waiting time. So transactions actually spend a lot less time in the man pool. That's an interesting phenomenon. There's, as I said, no, um, you know, theoretical framework that, framework that can, can explain this uh, formally. Um, it might uh, be due to easier fee estimation and the variable uh, block size, but uh, there's yet no, uh, no um, formal understanding of this. And we also observe that the EIP uh, has a small effect on, uh, small negative effect on consensus security in terms of uh, fork rate and network load uh, the increase of uh, these two uh, metrics uh, is insignificant. But, uh, but MEV does become the larger share of minus revenue after the EIP. So this leaves us with a plenty of um, interesting future direction to explore. As Tim put it, um, this EIP, uh, this new mechanism design is re something really cool and uh, we are, there are new findings that can be explained by existing theoretical models, and that 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 understanding um, 
understanding some of these new findings in, in a formal way and a rigorous way is interesting future direction. And also mempool data is something that uh, we, um, we leverage a lot in this study. And it, it actually enables us to understand the blockchains in ways that are almost impossible otherwise. Right? Without mempool data, it's how, how would you measure waiting time? So um, it, uh, we are working with um, we are working with Ethereum Foundation uh, under the sponsorship of Ethereum Foundation on a project to, to dig deeper into mempool data to understand the blockchains in in various aspects. Um, and finally, we have published uh, uh, the our data and the script uh, uh, with the with the correct waiting time uh, at the GitHub repo. Uh, we, we hope this will uh, help uh, other researchers to, uh, to get a hold of the uh, mempool data uh, around that time period of time and, uh, and also um, uh, conduct uh, uh, follow-up uh, works. And with that, uh, I will uh, wrap up uh, the talk. Uh, the paper uh, is posted uh, on archive. You can, you can, you're welcome to take a look. It's, uh, accepted in CCS 2022. And we uh, also, uh, we have published, other authors have published a blog post at Decentralized Thoughts uh, blog. Um, so if you want to uh, have a shorter uh, ex explanation of the paper, um, you should check out, you can check out the blog post. And again, the code and data is also uh, published uh, on GitHub. Uh, thank you. Um, I will stop here and uh, uh, we will take uh, questions. Thank you.